Okay. Good evening, everyone. I think we'll make a, a wee start, if we may. Um, welcome to this sort of climate champion, stepping up to net zero round table um, with the for, with Conservation Without Borders and the Round Britain Climate Challenge. My name is Mike Robinson. I'm the Chief Exec of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, an organisation involved in all aspects of climate, nature, rewilding and geography. Um, the observant among you will note that I'm not Martin Valenti. Uh, unfortunately, Martin had an unavoidable uh, diary clash, so he's asked me to just step in at the last minute. And we've also had a call off from Isabel Sheldon from British Vault. Both have passed on their apologies that they can't be with us this evening. I am, however, delighted to stand in for Martin and to be your host this evening for this round table, aiming to rally leadership and support from business cities and regions around net zero and share updates on the Round Britain Climate Challenge in the run up to COP26 in Glasgow this November. Tonight, our lineup of speakers represents a broad range of industries from legal, financial, science and environmental to heavy industry and football. We'll be asking them what the challenges they faced in stepping up to net zero are, how they overcame them, whether they're personal or organisational. We will also get an update on the Round Britain Climate Challenge and how you can get involved. It's quite a fast paced event this evening and we're hoping to be done around six. So feel free to tweet about it. Um, but uh, we're fortunate to be joined by fantastic speakers from all walks of life. Sasha Dench, who hopefully most of you know, who's the CEO and founder of Conservation Without Borders. Argus Gaithan Hardy, who's the, one of the founders of Wild East. Tony Stevens, who's the head of PR at Tottenham Hotspur. Becky Klisman, who's from the Chancery Lane Project. Bruce Hayter, who's the chair and head of corporate and commercial at Ricks and K Solicitors and Emma Aylesworth, the Executive Director of Eco Attractions Group. Please do feel free to pop questions into the chat box as we go through and we'll try and come to those questions later in an open Q&A. But we'll begin with our first speaker, Sasha Dench, the Human Swan, the UN Ambassador, CEO and Founder of Conservation Without Borders. Sasha, over to you. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you very much for stepping in at the last minute um, for Martin. Um, yeah, it's, uh, that's excellent, amazing. And what else is amazing is that we have finally got to this point. So we are just now four weeks away from the launch of the project, which is great. And I wanna start with a thank you to all of the sponsors and supporters and everybody else who's got us to here at the moment. We have got, apart from the, the financial support, the equipment support, we've also had loads of support from people offering us places to camp, incredible stories, uh, contacts, help with permissions of all kinds. It's been absolutely incredible. So this mad idea that started in kind of September, October last year has finally got wings. So um, yeah, really excited for that. Also, thank you to an incredible um, number of people in the Conservation Without Borders team, most of whom came on board as volunteers at the beginning, just backing an idea that they thought was actually just mad enough to try to work. So um, yeah, thank you all very much for that. Um, as promised, a quick update. So I'm hoping that most of you have an idea of what the Round Britain Climate Challenge is. Briefly, it is um, an attempt to fly around the entire coast of mainland Britain in an electric power uh, an electric paramotor. It'll be the first circumnavigation in a paramotor and the first long distance expedition ever attempted in an electric motor. Um, but is it really about that? Well, for my A, there is, a, there is a Guinness World Record associated with that. So there's an obvious media hook with that. That's a very clear thing. But the reality of, of the project is that what it's really about is trying to rally the nation, bringing all sorts of people together from corporates to the public to, um, to, yeah, to uh, business and consumers, all of them rally around a, a new vision of what climate change means, going away from being this horrible dark cloud that um, is on the horizon that most people don't really want to deal with, to actually something that could be seen as an exciting adventure. If we pose climate change, as, as a challenge um, that we can all meet if we come together to do it, then I think we could reframe the way people feel about it, move towards a position of optimism. And as we know, there's, there's nothing 
there's nothing like putting some skin in the game um, with bringing a message like that. So just by attempting this in an electric paramotor, we're basically saying to people, as a, as a kind of metaphor for, for tackling climate change, what you really have to do is put an ambitious goal out there. And if it's ambition and ambitious enough, even if you don't know exactly how you're gonna make it work, if it's ambitious enough, you'll find lots of people will come together and try and help you. And there might be, there'll be challenges along the way. It's not gonna be easy, but that's what we're gonna to have to do. So it's kind of about rallying lots of people around it. And there's another thing that it's about. So when one of the reasons why we're pulling together this round, these round tables and uh, bringing in stories of different people like all the speakers that are here tonight and that's based on, on a message that I well, suppose a lesson I learned on the flight of the swans expedition um, which was around uh, motivating people to into a, into a, a new way of action um, and that was that what was very clear was that on my flight doesn't, didn't matter whether I was speaking to people in the Russian Arctic or um, school children in uh, in a school in, in Western England there were three key stages. One of them was that pretty much everybody is interested in the crazy lady trying to be a, a bird. Um, that personal endeavor gets people's attention. They, what really gets their imaginations going are the stories the, of the science, the research, the world through the eyes of the birds, which we'll get similar here that, from, from the aerial images. But the only thing that really made people start to put up their hand and offer to help was when I told stories about other people I'd met along the flyway that had offered to do something for the swans. And then they could see themselves in that. So they couldn't see themselves in the kind of the crazy lady doing the adventure, but they could see that actually if, if the, the Nanettes, um, you know, changing the, their hunting season, if that was going to make a difference, um, then maybe what they could do on their fish farms in Poland um, was also going to make a difference. And they could start to see then that lots of different people acting together can um, add up to, to real significant change. So that's what it's really about. And that's what, um, that's what this expedition is about and this event. So thank you all for coming along, all to all the speakers, for coming along to share their stories. Um, and the other thing that we want to do in terms of rallying the public is this second world record, which is a really important one, which is through Countersin. Um, the Countersin record is a, a, a Guinness World Record again. We're trying to get 140, 140,001, more than 140,001 people to sign up to take action on climate change through the Countersin platform. And with that, I'll hand over to Amanda. So some of you on here will have heard about it before. The date for that is actually starting on June the 18th, uh, when we will have our first public launch event in, in Glasgow. So I'll get Amanda to mention very briefly the sort of assets that are available for anybody who wants to jump on board with that, um, from anyone from schools to companies wanting to engage their staff, and others are all able to, to join in with that. Um, but I think that's about it from me. Have I mentioned enough of the updates? So we've got the, the batteries are all here. So for all those who know we've been struggling to get the batteries in from overseas, the batteries are now all in the country. The paramotor is all in the country and finely tuned. The vehicles are fully branded are arriving tomorrow, which will be amazing. We have our launch date and special guests coming to, to meet us in Loch Lomond at the start. So yeah, we are pretty much ready to go in about four weeks time. Over to you, Amanda. Excellent. So um, we're working, as, as Sasha said, we're working with Countersin um, to, and it's a brand new challenge. Um, it's a, a, a first attempt at a new Guinness World Record title, Countersin. Um, as Sasha said, um, it's for, a, it's a campaign and the most pledges against a, an environmental sustainability campaign internationally within the space of a month uh, and that month um, will begin on the 18th of June when we have our first launch day at Loch Lomond um, with the whole team. Uh, the expedition as Sasha said will take off hopefully on the 21st of June. Um, we're working very closely and we've produced several um, pieces of collateral of resources that all of the team can use uh, within that month um, and hopefully you'll be able to see them now. So everybody that uh, pledges um, will be able to go to our website, Conservation Without Borders, and download a package of um, resources and also badges, etc., that you can use across social media, whether it be Twitter, Instagram, or in email footers. 
that you can use to demonstrate that you've done it and hopefully amplify the message so that we can get to our target of 140,000. Um, Countersin are working across all of their platforms. Uh, Guinness World Records are absolutely supporting this attempt. So any help and support and sharing that you can give would be amazingly appreciated. Um, it's an individual pledge. So whether it's yourself and your families, your business and your employees, your, your um, friends and anybody else that you may know or communities that you work in, please do direct everybody to these resources. Um, there'll be a link on our website where you can go to sign up and pledge. Um, and from the 18th of June, we will start counting. So with any luck, um, by the end or before the end of the expedition, uh, not only will, be, will we be beating one uh, Guinness World Records attempt, hopefully we'll be beating two. At the end of that, everybody that has taken part is welcome to uh, request a badge to say that you've been a participant in a successful world record attempt as well. So um, please share far and wide. Please visit our website just whilst I'm here as well, because we're regularly updating it with resources almost on a daily basis. Um, and please make sure that you follow our hashtags at Round Britain Climate Challenge and Count Us In. Thanks very much. Fabulous. Thanks, Amanda. I'm sure all of us have got networks, uh, contacts, colleagues, families. So do all um, sign up. Let's see if we can get that record. That would be wonderful. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker, though, Argus Gaithan Hardy, who is the founder of Wild East, a re uh, rewilding project uh, based down in Suffolk. So, Argus, over to yourself. Hi there. Um, so, I think that so what, what one of the key points is we're not just about rewilding, it's about nature recovery in the eastern region and um, really exciting all the themes which um, feel like they're coming through today. The, the idea of conservation without borders particularly, ours is a, it, 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 although it's a regional focus, it's a blurred focus um, and then picking up on a, another message there with the, um, so our, our identity is the links which forms the, the rough shape of our brand and also the mapped area that we want around East Anglia. Um, but it's also in order to, um, a, a bit like what you're talking about there, Sasha, about the, the lady in the, in the, in the, um, the bird plane, um, it, it, it creates a, a, an idea that we want to bring back the links, which some people find negative, some people find positive, but it's an immediate, something pe people can latch onto and a, a point of discussion, but essentially what we want is to create a, an abundance that has been lost in the last 70 years across our farm landscape, but also across our regional landscape in terms of the um, any indicator that you care to choose from bird life to wildflower meadows um, to um, uh, in, invertebrates. There's been a massive decline across all species. The, We've all come to it through a, a, a point of crisis, as it were. We've been working in conservation projects on our own farm. Uh, some of the messaging is negative. It's, it's about a, a state of collapse. So what we've wanted to do is recreate um, connectivity between the farmed landscapes, which his, the, the, the three founders are from quite disparate parts of East Anglia. And there was no way we could we could do that. We'd actually we'd gone up to Scotland where we saw the scale of nature recovering on some really exciting projects in Scotland, um, and that we realised we couldn't achieve that in East Anglia. So the, the way we set about it is to make it in um, in inclusive as possible, democratisation of nature recovery, um, to get everyone involved. And the message is to get away from a blame game. Is to create a positive message that. If we all get involved, we all give 20% of whatever we have towards nature recovery, whether we're on a farm, an industrial estate, a churchyard, a farmyard, a backyard, it doesn't matter that as long as we all do that process of, of pledging what we can, it doesn't matter the scale. And I think that's also a really important message that anyone can get involved. Um, that there's, a, there's a certain, feeling that it's all beyond us, um, that the, the scale of the problems is too much for any individual to, 
to to deal with to make a difference um we are a a, a large region but in terms of uh, nature recovery across uh, a uk scale across a european scale we have some very important habitats but the the message has to be to re restore abundance we've got to get nature recovery happening everywhere on all land uses on all scales so it's a scattergun approach we've put this flag in the in the in the sand declared east anglia a bioregion um nature recovery region it's roughly 3.5 million hectares in in our region um sorry 1.25 million hectares but we're, we're asking for a 20 percent commitment which roughly works out as 250,000 hectares which is half the size of yellowstone national park but the way we do this is through individual pledges it's not a um it's it's a sort of pledge from the heart it's not a, a physical commitment it's not a financial commitment it's saying that you are part of a movement and that the way we're manifesting this to begin with is in a playful way we've created something called the map of dreams and anyone can pledge to it across any land use um, whatever they're doing be it in a school uh, an industrial estate a church a community project um, and then as we mature that that develops so the the idea behind the map is that we can celebrate what people are doing now we're looking for exemplars we're bringing people in we're getting them on the map again on any scale and then the idea is to celebrate their work encourage the willing to follow suit people who don't know how to get involved can see from the exemplars what to do and then persuade the reluctant um whether within neighboring farms seeing how they can get involved how they can join up so it's really really exciting having um involvement with um certainly with with the um with sasha and and the idea of conservation without borders i think one of our focuses we're not a dramatic landscape we have a lot of rivers that run through it they're very short stories they they start um 20 miles inland from the sea they run through to the coast pass through very predictable landscapes of clay um loam heath sand and into the sea but they have diverse habitats across this and um they they run through towns villages into estuaries there's no borders in terms of transition between rural and urban although we're a largely undeveloped um region within the uk so that really accords with us and i think the um the journey that sasha's sort of joining us on uh, when she comes to the wild east is a, is a really good summary of, of what's coming through they're all pledges um the first is to summer Layton, which is um hugh who's the founding founder as it were um he's creating a um uh 2000 acre um essentially rewilding project around a lake fritton lake which is an old broad and then moving on to warren school which is in lowestoft which summer Layton, um bounds onto so they've pledged a series of orchards, meadows, open spaces that they work with, with a series of um, different schools uh, and, and with their, their own um, uh, classes, which are for uh, children with severe learning disabilities, trying to give access to nature um, and, and education, which is another key um, sort of tenant of the Wild East movement, is trying to get into schools, as many schools as possible. And then moving on to the Papillion project in Reefham, which is a similar um, similar approach, community approach, getting people in, getting spreading the word about nature recovery, trying to be an exemplar, but on a very small scale for other people to follow suit. And then on to Massingham Heath, which is a 500 acre um, heathland recovery as part of a what would have been a network of heathland that spread from North Norfolk right across the country down to Stonehenge. And that involves this large scale heathland restoration, but also a school group um, who've got their own um, as wildlife ponds, dipping ponds, small nature areas, a community group who are doing things on a village green and also within their own gardens and allotments. And then a local nature reserve that's been set up again on a small scale by a local group. So that sort of encapsulates the idea of the Wild East that you start off with a seed idea 
put the flag in the ground and then all these different groups coalesce around it, um, not with any specific idea that we're trying to promote, it's just the idea of nature recovery and um, not targeting specific species, but just trying to recreate abundance. That's great, so, Argus, thank you. So, thank you. That's really wonderful. And uh, great, sounds like a great project on uh, nature recovery um, across the entire area. So I assume you can put details in the chat box about how people can get involved or find out more. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, great, a great example of inclusiveness. And uh, I love the idea of the map of dreams as well. So, um, and that inclusiveness, we can sort of pick that up now because uh, we uh, now have the head of PR from Tottenham uh, Hotspur Football Club. Uh, Tony Stevens is going to explain why the away strip is green. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to say that the, uh, the choice for away strip being green was uh, was down to our green credentials, but uh, of course we uh, have adopted green as a uh, as a colour at Spurs mainly uh, since our uh, our iconic and famous uh, Champions League semi final victory um, in the colour of green. But of course, uh, the colour of green and green generally um, is of paramount importance at Tottenham Hotspur. Um, pleased to say that we were recently named uh, the Premier League's greenest club following a, a study carried out by Sport Positive and, and BBC Sport earlier this year. Um, and of course, being a, a Premier League football club, we, we do have an incredible platform um, to be able to inspire positive behaviours when it uh, comes to sustainability, which is a, a key part of why we are a founding partner of, of Counter Sin. Um, but I'll just uh, start uh, from, from, the, uh, from the beginning, really, in terms of uh, Tottenham Hotspur's climate journey, realising that I'm only speaking for three to five minutes. Um, but sustainability is really something that is in uh, the club's DNA and has been now for uh, many years. Uh, we, we were actually a founding partner of the uh, 1010 initiative all the way back in, in 2009. Um, which, which was similar to what counts in, uh, counters, counters in is, is now really in terms of encouraging businesses large and small to cut their carbon emissions by, by 10%. So our involvement in, in that particular project has informed our, our policies ever since. And obviously during that time, we've, um, we've been involved in two huge capital expenditure projects, one being our, our training centre uh, in Enfield in North London, which was uh, built in 2012 and then more recently of course was our our new stadium project um, which was uh, completed in in 2019 um, both of these these projects were undertaken with sustainability very much in mind so our training center was was built on on greenbelt land and we've not only um, restored but helped wildlife really return and thrive in in that area from what we've developed there um, Sasha was was fortunate enough, I'd like to say, to to come and visit um, recently uh, and, and and look around at some of the ecological measures that we have in place there, uh, including bug hotels, bat houses, um, the introduction of various uh, hedgerows, um, both historic um, restoring historic ones and creating new ones, in, and thousands of, of trees on on the site, uh, wildflower meadows log piles, um, grey crested newt ponds, all with the, um, the intention of uh, re reintroducing wildlife to the area. And then of course, there are many measures across the development which assist with sustainability, seed and green roofs, uh, a, a water drainage system, um, which, which encourages reuse throughout the site through an attenuation pond and uh, boreholes uh, in the drainage system. Um, so that's that's been in place now for, as I say, coming up to to ten, to ten years. And some of those uh, methods we um, we kept in mind when we were developing the the new stadium. So again, the very building fabric of the of the stadium is designed to reduce heating and cooling demands. Uh, everything is done intelligent controls. It's um, scope zero to emissions. Uh, and then it's everything that's within the building and, uh, and around sort of fan experience. So we've we've seen a huge amount of investment into the local public transport infrastructure, uh, which has helped us rapidly reduce um, private car travel on on match day since the stadium since the stadium opened by around 22%. Uh, 
uh, which you know equates to thousands of people when you consider the capacity increase of the the two stadiums from 36,000 to 62,000. Uh, and then there is um, things like the uh, plastic reduction measures. We were really one of the first to come out and um, say that we were going to sort of aim to be a plastic free stadium while we were building the, the stadium. So that goes across all of our catering outlets. There's no um, plastic cutlery or packaging that's used to, to serve to serve the food. Uh, our players now even drink out of um, cast and water on a match day as opposed to plastic bottles. Uh, and uh, and we obviously have reusable bags um, that we that we use in our retail stores on on a match day as well. Uh, and then there's obviously just the, the habits that we're trying to encourage, such as recycling, the re reusable beer cup scheme, for example, uh, running across the stadium, whereby the cups are collected after after matches, washed and and, and reused off site, and then brought back. Uh, and then the same with the sort of waste materials and how we encourage fans to, to use the right bin, um, the dry mixed recycling and, and general waste. And obviously creating more uh, plant-based food options as well, which where we have plant-based food options across all of our food outlets at the stadium. So we're really trying to encourage um, fans to, to take those options more. And it goes back to what um, Argus was saying that, you know, it's, it's not about being perfect and doing everything um, perfectly as an individual. It's about taking small steps. And that's why we were so proud to, to partner with, with Countess In, um, because using our platform, we can drive you know, the millions and millions of, of followers that we have towards that platform where you can literally just take one step and it can, it can make a difference. Um, the last few months we've been involved in an initiative called Planet Super League, which is, which is tied to, to, to Countess In, and we've had around 60 families sign up uh, to compete for Spurs by, by taking on uh, sustainable challenges at home. And, and that sort of thing is, is making a difference. And, and it's those sort of changes which uh, a football club like ours can, can inspire uh, lots and lots of people to do uh, from all walks of life and, and around the world. So that's what we uh, feel is really gonna, gonna make a difference. And we're gonna, really gonna, as we, as we hope to see fans returning greater numbers over the coming months as we emerge from the pandemic, really hammer home the, the, the county and messages when we've got that captive audience. And then in terms of our behaviour as a club, we recently signed up to the UN Sports for Climate Action Framework, which we, whose aims are in line with the, um, with the Paris Agreement in terms of um, aims to, to reach net zero by, by 2050. So um, we're in line with that. We're quite early on our, on our journey to be um, uh, towards net, net zero. Um, but we've recently um, started a really exciting partnership uh, with a company called Vivo Power, who are uh, doing a survey of both our training centre and stadium, um, looking at ways to uh, incorporate battery technology power um, for, for both sites, as well as a, a range of other measures such as solar panelling, etc. Um, so that's really going to help us in our, in our journey towards, towards net, net zero as well. And um, just finally, um, obviously, why, why I'm, I'm here today um, has uh, uh, been in conversation with Sasha now for, for some months um, around our support of the, the Round Britain Climate Challenge. So um, we, we hope to welcome um, Sasha on her journey at the, uh, the training centre uh, as, a, as a stop on a landing stop on her journey um, and, and an opportunity for us to uh, celebrate not only what she is doing, but also again use our platform to spread the word about the accounts in world record that's taking place. So, uh, for everyone watching today, uh, thank you and and do follow us uh, on all of the socials uh, at Spurs Official. Uh, we'll we'll obviously be communicating all of our uh, sustainability work and encouraging people to to sign up to to count us in and support the world record. So, thank you for having me. Oh, yes, thanks, Tony, and uh, really, really encouraging just to see all the work that's going on uh, with Spurs. Uh, yet another reason to support the team if anyone needed one. But uh, no, terrific and lovely to see that sort of uh, across all of your different areas of work too. As you touched on, it's sort of small steps in the right direction. I think it's really important. Um, at RSGS, we think it's really important that people um, are helped along that journey. We're all on a journey together. We're all at different points on that journey. And uh, and we've all got a journey to do around climate change. Um, and one of the things that we've understood that's held back a lot of businesses, particularly, is really an, a deep understanding of the issue 
and how it impacts their business and most importantly, what they can do about it. So over the last four years, we've been working with the Institute of Directors and two universities to produce a qualification for managers in understanding climate change solutions. Uh, and if I can screen share, I'm gonna just very quickly uh, play you this short uh, video that'll explain a little bit more about the course. I cannot say that I'm very proud of what my generation has done and what we are going to leave them. But we still have time to do something and we cannot afford to fail. Welcome to the Climate Solutions Qualification. This programme contains four modules and one workshop and will build your knowledge and skills on how to respond to the most profound challenge faced by managers, climate change. We have knowledge about approximately what is going to happen if we don't act. And there are tipping points. The future living conditions for all species are at risk. During the one day workshop, you will develop your own climate solutions plan. Throughout the modules, there is an online learning journal for you to complete and refer back to when developing your plan. Every business is going to have to ask themselves and should be asking themselves, how will climate change affect my business today, tomorrow, in the decades ahead? And what am I doing about it? What am I doing to adjust? The context in which organisations operate is about to change. And it's only those that are climate change ready that will be able to survive and prosper. You have to be responsible long term. Your actions or your inactions are going to determine the future of the children of your country and the children of other countries. Really it's down to um, business leaders, decision makers, to implement the changes that will make a real difference. Future employment will depend on being able to think, talk and act in a climate positive way. Okay, I hope you could all hear and see that. Um, so that's something we've been putting out there. Um, trying to encourage businesses. I'm pleased to say that we um, well, we only launched it last year. We've had uh, over nearly 400 people on the professional course and we've just launched a 90 minute version, which is a bit easier for most people who are busy in business. And uh, we launched that in December. And I'm very pleased to say that we've had tens of thousands of people sign up for that course already. So it is really exciting. It seems to be helping people understand the issue better and moving them forward. So now, uh, if you want to know more, just uh, drop me a line. Anyway, enough of that. On with the um, speakers tonight. We have Becky Clisman here from the Chancery Lane Project. So we're going to hear from Becky. Thank you so much. Um, so the Chancery Lane Project is all about helping law firms and in-house legal teams to rewire their contracts to address the climate risks and impacts of the transactions that they undertake. And in under two years, our participants, who are all volunteers by the way, have drafted over 70 climate clauses that cover areas as diverse as supply chains, real estate transactions and commercial law. We have engaged over a thousand lawyers who have uh, across 150 organisations and they have collectively donated over 10,000 hours of pro bono time. And our clauses have been downloaded over 57,000 times across 73 countries. So I think we've made a bit of an impact already. I got involved with this project um, because I'm an environmental lawyer actually in my, in my day job. And, and uh, some time ago, I helped the Carbon Trust set up their account management service for FTSE 250 companies. That was way back in the days when pretty much nobody had heard about climate change. Um, and a few years ago, I was feeling very sort of challenged actually by um, the youth climate movement and the fact that here was I as, as a sort of a professional who knew quite a lot about climate change, um, but wasn't doing as much as I felt I could be doing in, in my day job. And then along came this amazing project, the Chancery Lane project. And what I love about this project, and I think this speaks to what Argus was saying, is that it allows you to do something in your day job without having to retrain, 
without having to become an expert or, or do a degree or anything like that, you can change what you're doing to respond to the climate crisis right now. So, um, and, and you know, for, for people who are feeling that really they're, they're worried about climate change and they're worried about what, what world their children are going to inherit, it's amazing to think that you can actually do something right away. And for I'm actually hugely motivated because when I think about what my two girls might be inheriting as a world, I, you know, the, the sort of risks of runaway climate change and, um, you know, lack of food production, extreme weather events and climate related conflicts, that's all absolutely terrifying. So, you know, I want to be a good, good steward of the, of the parts of the world that I can influence or the communities that I'm part of. And we all know that our window of opportunity to turn things around on a climate basis is rapidly closing. So we need to accelerate that net zero transition. So I also wanted just to sort of mention a couple of things that, you know, what, what we've learned doing the project so far. And I think what is what's really important, and I think what, what's sort of coming across with some of the other speakers um, this evening is it's about giving people agency. It's about about making them understand that, you know, climate change is this huge global issue, but we can all do something to make a difference. And TCLP is about showing lawyers what they can do to step up to the plate and make changes to their, you know, in their professional lives to tackle the crisis. And it's a wonderful alignment of that sort of moral imperative to do something and that need for justice, but also commercial sense, because we know that if businesses and communities don't rapidly transition to net zero, then the world that we know, the business as well, business as usual world that we know is going to disappear very rapidly and be quickly replaced by something that is much riskier and much harder to survive in. And, you know, just in sort of line with the, the nature based theme of this evening, you know, businesses and, and individuals that fail to act now are going to become extinct. So I think our main learning is for, for everyone listening, step into your power, just start your net zero journey today, it, you know, Everyone always says a journey starts with that first step. So you do, you just put one foot forward and amazingly you start that journey and ignore the doubts of people who tell you it's too hard or other people need to be doing something. Step out into your power now and get yourself informed and get on with action right away. Um, I, we, we, we are not actually involved with, with the, uh, the, 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 the programme we're talking about tonight, but like TCLP. I think it's very much focused on action and it's about taking that first step and getting involved. So I, I think our, our, our values are very much aligned and I look forward to future work across the projects together in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Becky, and uh, what fantastic enthusiasm and, and uh, joy you bring to it as well. So you're clearly very uh, passionate about what you do. I, I like that idea of stepping into your power too. Um, I had a very deep privilege of uh, meet, meeting uh, Polly Higgins, um, actually, who I know really reinforced the importance of, of law and the legal profession in this whole arena. Uh, and, uh, and that's probably a good moment to introduce our next speaker, who's Bruce Heater, who's the chair and head of corporate and commercial at Ricks and K Solicitors. Bruce, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Bruce Hayter, Ricks and Kay Solicitors based in Sussex and Kent. And uh, I'm going to very briefly give you an overview of Ricks and Kay's journey um, into uh, the uh, support for Conservation Without Borders and Sasha. Back in 2008, I was very lucky to be introduced to Penn Haddo, uh, polar explorer and uh, environmentalist. And uh, Ricks and Kay worked with Penn in putting together the Captain Arctic survey. Um, the other members of the team were Anne Daniels and uh, Martin Hartley. This was a three year scientific survey bringing together explorers and scientists and uh, was from 2011 to 2013. Uh, I, I think I famously was quoted as saying, I'll support you every way, every step of the way, but nowhere near the ice as uh, polar exploration wasn't really uh, my thing. Uh, we were involved in preparing uh, sponsorship agreements, contracts with suppliers, and basically putting the legal uh, documents together to get the, the team up and running. Um, the relationship with Penn and Anne and Martin has continued, and we've been very fortunate that uh, Penn 
and Anne have spoken to gatherings of Ricks and Cade colleagues over the years, raising awareness about uh, the climate change issues. And uh, indeed, that relationship uh, continues with CWB in that um, Anne is one of the patrons of CWB. And uh, equally, Sasha has spoken at several events now uh, for Ricks and K, raising awareness uh, with regard to climate change. Uh, I was introduced to WWT uh, back in 2016 by Jackie Peterson, uh, who was part of the PR team for the Catlin Arctic Survey and was working with WWT. And uh, the relationship uh, grew there with the amazing flight of the swans. And again, we were involved in the legal work. Uh, one of the really positive outcomes uh, for Ricks and Kay was that we were able to show the video of the flight of the swans to about 100 colleagues and guests, again, raising awareness of the work that Sasha was doing. So when we were asked to become involved with uh, Conservation Without Borders and continued support for Sasha, uh, that again was a great privilege. And we're again delighted uh, to support the uh, Round Britain Climate Challenge and also involved hopefully in the next uh, project, the Flight of the Ospreys. So in addition to the legal work, what's Ricks and Kay done? Well, we were fortunate um, with Penn, Haddo, and uh, Daniels and Martin Hartley that this started to raise awareness within Ricks and Kay some time ago. And we were able to introduce uh, policies and impacting upon uh, company car usage, emissions, um, the legal profession is well known for the high use of paper and we've targeted reductions there, recycling, and at the time, we were also able to uh, bring in new energy efficient lighting, heating into our buildings, etc. So what have we done, uh, done now? Um, working with Sasha has really given us a, a new uh, start and in, in innovation and invigoration in what we can be doing within our business. We're not paperless, but it's step by step. Some of our teams are indeed paperless. We constantly review uh, what's happening with the guards to car usage and uh, going forward agile working and the hybrid working arrangements are likely to reduce uh, travel within the business which is a very positive thing. Recycling has continued and uh, we've done a, a reasonable amount but there's always a lot more to do and that's what we're committing to do now and certainly the Countess In project uh, initiative is something that we've signed up to and we'll be working towards with in our business and also hopefully trying to influence our colleagues to uh, to become involved as well. Uh, we've recently joined uh, the uh, Chancery Lane Group, which you've heard from, from Becky earlier, and my colleague Joe Bryan has been involved in drafting some of the uh, recent uh, clauses in relation to leases. So we're trying to take a very positive step in terms of the way in which we view the world and try to make a, a small change within our business to, uh, to keep us on track. So it's not just about the law, we're a business and we've got to do more to encourage our, our colleagues and indeed friends to, to work towards uh, something better. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Bruce. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, lovely to hear um, Penn Haddo's name as well, actually, and Daniels Martin Hartley. Great company uh, that you keep. Um, Penn was a vice president of the Scottish Geographical. He grew up in Perthshire. Always told me a story that the reason he was actually um, quite good with the cold is because he had a really strict nanny that used to lock him out the house in his shorts in the winter. Uh, and he built up quite, a, <laughs> quite an ability to survive cold weather, which is just as well with his Arctic trips. So. Uh, Great, great stuff. Okay, I'm delighted to introduce our last speaker tonight, which is Emma Aylesworth, who's the Executive Director of Eco Attractions Group. So, Emma, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so we are a like-minded alliance of visitor attractions that connect people to nature and inspire sustainable living. And we include uh, well-known ones like the Eden Project and the Centre of Alternative Technology to hidden gems like Mark's Hall Estate in Essex and Queenswood, Arboretum and Bodenham Lake. Um, as a group, we very much believe we are stronger because we work together. And our 10 eco attraction members are all about engaging people to take positive action in inspiring and simple ways. 
So we were absolutely delighted to come on board and work with Conservation Without Borders on this exciting conservation adventure. Um, we got involved firstly because um, I used to work at WWT and I was very much uh, aware of the, the, the flight of the swan. So there was evidence that this type of conservation adventure works in inspiring the public. And as a collective, we knew that uh, this was exactly the kind of project our eco attraction members would want to support. Um, it's exciting, it's filled with passion about bringing people together. It's about positive human stories showing everyone can help and be part of the positive solutions. So it, you know, it's a wonderful thing because it's a good news story about climate change. Um, our members are championing amazing climate change campaigns and projects. So from large scale carbon neutral visitor experience redevelopment, such as the new Eden project um, in Foyle in Northern Ireland, and a new visitor experience at the Centre for Alternative Technology and Mark's Hall um, in Essex to really exciting rewilding projects. So it's really interesting hearing Wild East earlier. Um, one of our members, the Wildwood Trust, has got a, a, a project called Wilder Bleen, uh, which is a bison project and a woodland restoration project. And um, also some of you might be aware of the Centre for Alternative Technology Zero Carbon Britain. And there's also lots of really small, wondrous projects such as Pavement Plants for People, um, which is all about depaving local high streets, installing rain gardens and doing planting with kids to turn the grey to the green and help combat climate change. And that's with South London Botanical Institute in London. Um, we've been working with Conservation Without Borders on a, on, a, on a range of things, so from everything from creating a catalogue of amazing positive action stories to feature. Um, we re we're very hopeful that some of our coastal eco-attractions will become landing sites and we'll, we'll be delighted to welcome Sasha and the crew and uh, share inspiring climate action projects that are happening within the local area. Um, Sasha is going to be speaking at the Trust for Sustainable Living's International Debate and Essay Summit, which last year inspired half a million ch children. And it's very much about uh, taking action and creating the next generation of environmentalists and advocates for a healthy planet. And this platform will give Round Britain Climate Challenge the opportunity to inspire worldwide and also promote the next project, Flight of the Ospreys, which hopefully will happen next year. Um, we've been working to connect the team with other inspirational organisations such as the fantastic Chancery Lane Project who you've just heard from and also organisations like GridServe who are working to develop um, electric vehicle um, EV rapid charge that everyone across the UK has access within five miles of a rapid charger from their home. And uh, the Trust for Sustainable Living are helping to develop open access education resources with other organisations. and. We as a group, we will be promoting this project and also the Count Us In campaign to our 17 million audiences through our digital media channels. One of the things we're really quite excited about is the opportunity for legacy of this project. Um, there's going to be the most incredible content collected on the way, audio, images, footage, data about how climate change um, is affecting Britain, but also the, the positive things that, that people are doing on a, on a daily basis and really inspirational things. And we're passionate about the opportunity to develop this into an amazing from air experience that could be developed into an at home and at our eco attraction members and also other learning establishments um, and public engagement spaces across the UK. There's potential to use creative technology such as um, augmented reality to enhance that and share the incredible um, data. And um, we're also hopefully going to be taking that to uh, or working with um, Sasha and the team at Great Big Green Week, which is run by the Climate Coalition, which is running up to COP. Um, so I just wanted to end on a, a, a sort of a note about where the public perception is at the moment towards climate cha change in terms of what we feel. And our eco attraction members ethos is very much about helping engaging the public and changing public perception towards nature and sustainability, and even more so in light of COVID. And it's very evident that people are much more aware. It's an all time high that the majority see climate change is no longer a public debate in terms of whether it is happening or not, especially amongst younger audiences. 
Although the immediacy has been overshadowed by the pandemic, the pandemic has also showed us visually during the first lockdown how we can build back better in terms of air pollution, increased birdsong, et cetera. And organizations like Counters In, Extinction Rebellion, ambassador, ambassadors such as um, Young Speakers, and all our eco attractions campaigns have been part of this movement and drive to change perception and behavior. However, there is a demographic divide in, in a recent survey of uh, 1,100 people, 65% of 18 to 35 year olds had not bought something because they felt it was not environmentally friendly compared to 42% of over 55 year olds. So I think the, the sort of ending point, um, traditionally, historically, we used to show uh, polar bears floating on melting icebergs, which very much pulls at the heartstrings but it makes you feel like you can't possibly play a part in helping climate change. However, projects like Round Britain Climate Challenge, they are human, they tell stories, they show positive actions. It's gonna demonstrate we all have a part to play and everyone can take positive action, however big or small. And it's gonna be truly exciting. So wish you all the success, uh, Conservation Without Borders with this. Thank you. Emma, thank you so much. That's great. And I, I totally echo your thoughts that this is there's never been a, a time when the public is more engaged in this issue. Um, I've, I've just left a agricultural inquiry panel this afternoon and um, I, certainly within the farming community that the, uh, the desire to play a part in this is absolutely overwhelming and it's really turned around in the last sort of 18 months. So um, we have got time for um, a short Q&A. Um, so if anybody has any questions for the panel uh, or wait, wishes to make commitments um, or promises to be part of the Count Us In campaign, can you please let us know, raise your virtual hand and we'll try and uh, come to you. Um, but while we wait for that, Sasha, um, what's your sort of aspirations then for, for COP and how do you think this project fits with all of that? My aspirations for COP are generally, uh, you know, COP should go ahead. That's great. Lots of the uh, conversations and negotiations that are all around global commitments have been going on for some time. So I guess what I'd really like to see is that the COP uh, people, businesses um, in particular around the country and uh, see COP as being uh, a, a moment of motivation as opposed to an event to be at. So it's a it's something to rally around and to really, um, yeah, rally the country around the, the big question which we phrased as if Britain drove the industrial revolution, which in many ways is, uh, is the case, um, we can definitely drive the green revolution too. So I, that's what I'd like to see, that people just see COP as being a moment um a, a moment to, to rally around and the public that in particular what we want to do is show the public that we can all actually um play a part in that and uh, it's not just a un event that other people do and they'll they'll fix it um and that is a key part of conservation without borders as well why i founded it in the first place was whilst the name sounds like it's about migratory species which we are definitely doing a lot of journeys through the eyes of migratory species the without borders was really at heart about telling the world actually that you can't leave the issues of conservation in the hands of conservation organizations like they're not big enough and they haven't got it covered it's going to take everybody and um, you really need all sorts of people so yeah that's the core of it um questions has anybody got questions more questions are there questions coming in i'm not seeing we've only got a few minutes left but you do have time for some questions Becky, I was going to come to you maybe that um, we're talking about all sorts of different organisations getting involved and Sasha's has demonstrated the power of a good idea. What do you think, what, legally, what do you think might be possible to get from COP this year? Um, I, I, to be honest, COP is, 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 a, is a political question. I, for me, it's about political will. And I, I think what you said a couple of minutes ago is, is certainly what we've experienced at the Chancery Lane project. Um, th there has been this just groundswell of, of, of willingness to engage with the issue of climate change and how businesses need to not just to make a climate you know, net zero target, but they need to actually start that transition process. And that's about doing the sort of very granular stuff, get, making changes to legal agreements, starting to, to actually do these kind of nature-based projects and, and 
really sort of taking it from being something we talk about to something we do, which is obviously exactly what Sasha is doing. You know, it's it's the how of it, not the why of it anymore. Yep, no, I agree. And I think that there's a strong message coming across from all the speakers about getting involved and, and, and doing and actually starting to make things happen. So Argus, with your rewild, so your nature recovery and rewilding project, of course, um, what sorts of things are you hoping people can do to actively participate on the ground? Well, one, one thing that's just coming out of this for me is the, the idea of conservation without borders, but which has been going around with us. So we started off with the idea of rewilding, but in a sense, that's another creating another border. It's creating another place where nature happens. And I think what we're trying to do is to break down the borders between ourselves and natural habitats. So one of the areas we've been looking at, and funnily enough, was um, food without borders. So the, the idea that um, food is, is a process of sharing, it's a process of, of creation, and it's also something that can't happen without a thriving habitat, a thriving ecosystem. So it's trying to bring back food production into, um, into nature recovery and not creating um, conservation as something having, happening outside the farmed environment. Um, but then that links back to the consumer. So it's how we reach out to consumers and persuade people, because it's also a divisive argument to say to people, you know, you shouldn't eat so much meat. Um, meat should be more expensive, that you know, food should be more expensive because of the systems that we're using are, are highly complex and highly expensive in order to create cheap food at a great expense. So there's a big debate around that. And I don't know if Sasha or anyone else has got any thoughts um, on food and um, consumerism and nature recovery. I, I'm hoping to speak to a lot of farmers on the on the whole way around. Obviously, we're camping with a lot of different farmers, so I'm kind of hoping that I'll be hearing hearing from others um, on yeah all all elements of that and where we can where we can go with it. But interestingly, just on a point in terms of nature, that's on the side of farming. But I heard uh, one of the reserve wardens at WWT once said when I asked, you know, in 25 years' time, if you're looking back on your career and speaking to your grandchildren, you want to tell them what you're most proud of. And he basically said, um, well, what I, if I look back, I can see in my career so far, we have built walls around areas of nature and call them nature reserves. And now people think that's where nature belongs and it doesn't belong mm. in other places. So whilst you say kind of the farming industry might have had a role to play in, in pushing nature out, then maybe um, uh, nature conservation organizations have also had a role in kind of stopping nature from um, from being allowed out. So um, I think, yeah, there's lots of deep thinking we've got to do, and I'm really looking forward to talking to people about it all the way around. Well, very, very valid point, Sasha. Very valid um, point you make. I'm always conscious that uh, people think golden eagles live on cliff tops, but it's just the only place they've been left to survive. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not this, it didn't start out there. Uh, we have a question um, that's come in through the chat box, which is, um, really asking all of the panel members very quickly for their thoughts on how do you encourage the kinds of behaviour change and at scale that we know is required. So Sasha, do you want to kick off with how do we make sure the behaviour change we need takes place? For me, I mean, I guess that's what we're trying to do. Like I said, what I noticed from the flight of the swans was that it was showing to people actually lots of other people taking action is what I've found is the most inspiring to people and showing that all those individual actions make a difference. Uh, I definitely think we're out of the phase of, you know, is climate change real, is it not, is it not real? Um, what I, you know, another element that we'd like to show with this expedition is to make, um, make it feel more local. And I mean, I've spoken to a lot of people that can give examples around the country of how they're having to deal with elements of climate change, but it's not generally in, in public awareness. Um, and like I had the experience last year of losing our house in the Australian bushfires, it definitely put climate change from a point of academic awareness 
um, in my head um, to suddenly being something I wake up in the morning thinking about. Um, it's there all the time. My mum's living in, a, in a, a small kind of dry caravan that's been donated because she lost everything and to a fire that was on a colossal scale. I mean, that was a very, a very big incident. But I think if we show examples all around the country of actually this is how locally other people are trying to deal with it, I think it might start to bring it all closer to home. So I'd say, sorry, bringing the issues closer to home, but also showing that lots of other people are doing something is our key way of doing it. Thanks, Sasha. And, and Tony, you've done huge amounts of um, behaviour change type activities at Spars. Have you got any thoughts about how other people can roll that out? What sort of things have really landed in terms of behavioural change? Uh, well, I mean, that yeah, you've hit the nail on the head, really. I mean, in terms of uh, behavioural change, there are a few industries um, that can influence behavioural change more than, than sport. You know, it has such a transformative power in that respect. So that's really the reason why we we are a partner of countersin um, we can use our our profile our platform uh, and our inspiration to to encourage others to to take to take those steps obviously as i said earlier it's all well and good huge organizations like ourselves being sustainable but it's how we can influence uh, th those at home which is why we're involved in in things like planet super league and um you know it's, it's about making things simple you know if you can reach young people um then i think that you know, you that's that's really the sort of target audience that we should be aiming for because obviously that's that's the future generation and by making fun and, and simple challenges um that you wouldn't even necessarily link to um making huge uh, amounts of difference in terms of sustainability we are seeing a lot of people getting involved you know just last week we had lucas mora who for those who don't know scored the famous goal in the green kit that, uh, <laughs> I referenced earlier. um make a phone call to, to some of the families that have been taking part and that just you know keeps them engaged and and, and keeps them uh, doing these the, these challenges uh, and and while I'm on the subject of players, you know we, we have uh, Eric Dyer. For those who, who maybe tuned into BBC News at ten um, last last Wednesday, I think it was, would have seen uh, him talking about um, not only the the, the club's efforts uh, in terms of sustainability, but his own, you know, at, at home, uh, having been inspired by the the kitchen garden that we have on site at the the training centre, where we're able to grow fruit and vegetables for our, for our players. He's, you know, he's gone back to his family home and started his, his, his own uh, growing project there. Uh, and again, you know, young people, especially seeing, seeing somebody like Eric on the TV speaking passionately about it, you know, can only help in, inspire um, those, those to go home and do, and, and do it, you know? Um, and one of his messages was, was exactly what a few of us have been speaking about, which is, you know, you don't have to try and do everything, just try and do, do one small thing um, in a simple way. And you are making a difference by, by doing that. But you know, we, we appreciate that we're very lucky. I wouldn't like to sort of suggest ways for others to sort of make a difference. We're very lucky in, in terms of the sort of reach and, and profile that we have and the fact that we have sort of players at our disposal to be able to get across those messages. But you know, everyone that's that's um, been speaking tonight is is doing a fantastic job in, in in their own in their own way. No, that's great, Tony, and uh, fantastic use of the players as well. It's just inspiring and rewarding the people that are taking part, and uh, and in the same way that Sasha's inspiring people with all her mad exploits as well. Uh, I'll just take one more quick question, Emma. I was going to ask you. There's a question in the chat box, just saying. There are, there's not just a climate change crisis, there's a biodiversity crisis. I thought that might link quite well with some of what the work you've been doing. So how would you, how do you tackle both? How do you make sure we don't lose sight of one and only deal with the other? Mm. Hi, um, thank you. Yes, um, uh, well, at most of our members' um, eco-attractions, uh, we, we look at it as a whole, um, and then we might, um, sort of look at specific um, areas. So we run project pollinate campaigns. And I think the big thing is um, not losing sight. We, you know, obviously this is a fantastic project about climate change, but um, we've, we've got other things within the environmental crisis to look at. So one of the things uh, I really love and I heard recently is that the idea of wanting sustainability and the word sustainability not to be in our vocabulary anymore uh, and because it's a habit, because it's like brushing our teeth. And that's something that our members are, are trying to work really hard at so that it becomes an everyday 
um, aspect of life rather than this word that we use, sustainability. Actually, it's, it's not a word that in the future, hopefully we, we need to rely on because it's in everyone's psyche and that we're, it's all part of our brushing our teeth regular um, psyche. So our members work hard on that and it's all about working together with, with lots of organizations. And I think that's the thing, mission-led organizations, it's, it can be tough, but coming together and working together, we've got a better opportunity of um, helping to, to solve some of these problems. Thanks, Emma. Great stuff. Um, just in terms of behaviour change, one of the things I often ask for if people feel they've done other things is just to be more permissive of change. I do think we all know that things need to be different. Uh, and I just think we need to actually allow it to happen in some cases, even if we can't necessarily do it directly. But uh, some other thoughts, I'm sure. But I just think we're going to wrap up in a minute. I'm going to hand over to Sasha to say a last few words and uh, remind you all how you can help and then we'll do a very quick wrap up. Okay, great. Uh, right, so there's a few things that were, um, were coming out of that. First of all, yeah, the, so the Countersin program, if there's anybody in this call who can either share it with as many as people as possible or companies as possible who could get their staff engaged. I know we've had a few big offers in the past like Accenture have said that they've got half a million staff globally full stop. So that alone, they alone could help us break the record. But the more possible 140,000 uh, people sounds like a big number for a new organization, but with a lot of help, we can do it. So if anybody wants any, uh, yes, more information, get in touch. Maybe Ruth, who's the best person to get in touch with? Best link, maybe you can put that in the chat or email everybody afterwards. Um, the second thing is there's been a few mentions of young people. Um, so yeah, we have got a schools program, which hasn't been mentioned so far, but we will be doing a dedicated um, a program twice a week that's going to be sent out to schools and there's a schools competition as well um, so that's going on we also have a university round table which is in the planning getting students to come together and share some of their ideas so again get in touch with that, us if you are interested in that or have a way of promoting that to more students that would be fabulous um, I think that's about all I can think of in terms of admin has anybody else got any other ideas? Oh, we are also still, we will carry on throughout the whole expedition calling for um, suggestions and ideas of uh, people that have either got a really interesting climate story where they're dealing with climate change in their work or ordinary life, um, and also people with great ideas, whether they're in, um, in industry, whether they're in community, um, community level, whether it's just an idea that um, with funding could really make a difference. Still interested in all of those and we'll keep calling for more ideas. Um, again, Ruth has all the details for that as well. Thank you all very much for sharing your stories. Fabulous. Thank you, Sasha. Inspirational as ever. And there's a lot of goodwill in the chat box. I'm sure there's loads of people there making all sorts of offers of, uh, of help and support and cheering you along the way. Uh, thank you to Conservation Without Borders, to Amanda, to all of our speakers tonight, Argus, Tony, Becky, Bruce and Emma. And thank you to all of you for coming along this evening. Please do stay in touch and we'll look forward to seeing you again.